The students keep asking, what should we do next? What can we accomplish? I feel so sad. Because how can I tell them that what we are actually hoping for is bloodshed? For the moment when the government has no choice but to brazenly butcher the people. Only when the square is awash with blood will the people of China open their eyes. Only then will they really be united. But how can I explain any of this to my fellow students? And what is truly sad is that some students and some famous, well-connected people are working hard to help the government, to prevent it from taking such measures. This is Chai Ling, the self-declared supreme leader of the Tiananmen Square protests. We'll get back to her soon. How about this, then? Tank Man is usually presented to Western audiences as some regular, brave guy standing up to a ruthless authoritarian regime. What you're not told is that a these are tanks leaving the square and the man is standing in their way, and b that there is video footage of this event, and what is always implied that this man is ran over by the tank never happened, instead he climbs atop, opens the hatch and starts chatting with the soldiers. In popular media, the widely recognized narrative of the Tiananmen Square massacre is typically presented as follows. In June of 1989, the Chinese government imposed martial law and deployed the military to quell a pro-democracy and freedom protest led by students. Troops and tanks entered Tiananmen Square and opened fire on unarmed protesters, resulting in the deaths and injuries of hundreds if not thousands of people. Some of the more exaggerated versions of the story include claims of tanks crushing students and machine guns being fired into the crowd, with bodies littering the square. All of the above is a lie, it never happened. So what did? Back to the video in just a sec. Okay, first some background. Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms in the late 70s shook up China's economy by introducing free market reforms, creating large gaps between the rich and poor, unsurprisingly, and bringing with it some very blatant forms of corruption. These reforms likewise scaled back welfare programs and relaxed price controls. This massively benefited Chinese farmers, of which there are a lot, and led to increased crop yields and spending by them, which, predictably in a market economy, caused inflation, mostly affecting urban dwellers. Students and urbanites expressed a certain sense of superiority, you could call it, over rural citizens and were not happy to see peasants and farmers do better than them, even less so foreigners. Following cuts to tuition subsidies, students began protesting the presence of African exchange students. Like most foreign students, the Africans enjoyed greater standards of living in China and some dated local women. Among the signs in the crowd at Heihai on Christmas Eve 1988 were placards demanding greater democracy, alongside ones proclaiming death to the black devils. I don't think you've ever seen this in any of the uh, commemorations. The political discussion of the era was very complex and spanned the entire political spectrum, of course, that's not surprising, China's a massive country. The liberal narrative, though, centers on Hu Yaobang, a popular reform leader who at that point had been a key advocate for political liberalization within the Chinese government. His sudden death on April 15, 1989, sparked student protests as many within that particular movement saw his demise as the end of a hope for Western-style liberal political reform. In the following days, the China Democratic Alliance, a US-based organization which wanted the outright establishment of capitalism in China, issued an open letter to Chinese university students, which was posted at many Beijing schools at the time advising that the complete negation of the anti-liberalization movement of 1987 should be used as a breakthrough point. For those that can't read between the lines, this is a subtle call for regime change from a foreign government. How fun. Regardless, students of a particular class background began to gather in Tiananmen Square to mourn Hu Yaobang and voice their frustrations with the government. This subsection of protesters, which the Western press overwhelmingly focused on, demanded, on paper, Western-style democracy, government accountability, and civil liberties like freedom of the press and speech, largely inspired by Hu. In reality, their interests were different and their demands were different. These weren't representatives of the collective will of China, but instead a layer of the intelligentsia who wanted to be elevated and given more privileges such as more political power and higher wages in their subsequent careers. When workers organized alongside them, students treated them with contempt. Despite their alliance on the square, educational and class differences continually hampered their relations. These students were not, after all, Lao Bai Xing, meaning common people. They exhibited a wariness about the articulation of economic demands by other groups and wanted to keep the movement exclusively under their control. They would go on to cordon off their marches from those who weren't students or so-called intellectuals afterwards. What started as a small gathering grew into a larger protest, with up to a million people joining in, though that was only at the very height. Towards the end of the protests, it would have been less than a tenth of that. Students set up makeshift camps, organized speeches, and created posters and banners displaying a wide variety of political positions, many of which including differing flavors of Marxism. 
Interesting that student campus in the US aren't very popular politically. That can't possibly be hypocrisy. Anyways, despite the festive atmosphere, there was an underlying tension, and on April 19th, a number of protesters attempted to storm Zhongnanhai, the headquarters of the party. This, along with certain very clear calls for the overthrow of the government by liberal student leaders, got the government's attention, unsurprisingly. Many more developments, including a struggle within the party itself, increased the seriousness of the movement, more than the students themselves had realized. It would take an hour to go over the specifics, so refer to the articles at the beginning of the video if you're interested. Regardless, martial law was declared over the area, but troops failed to arrive in Tiananmen Square in the middle of May because of roadblocks the students had set up around the city, and since the troops had orders to avoid violent confrontations, particularly with the students, it was difficult to enter the city as planned. Despite these martial law regulations though, the Chinese media allowed Western press to continue to make use of its transmission facilities. So much for a dictatorship, I guess. On May 27th, the Federation of College Students decided to represent their movement with a symbol, which was a plaster reconstruction of, I shit you not, the Statue of Liberty in Tiananmen Square. As if you needed any more information about where their ideological underpinnings lie, all this will become clear very soon. CIA cables gloated about how they wish this would anger the Chinese leadership, and in vague terms may have even ordered it. How about some more proof? Liu Xiaobo, a major protest leader who just one year prior called for the outright overthrow of the Chinese government, the institution of complete market reforms, and the replacement of Chinese culture with modern culture, read Western culture, that's what he meant, would arrive back in China from New York just in time for the protests, and would now call for armed struggle against the Chinese government. His reverse weeabooing for the West doesn't stop there, by the way. He's on record saying, it would take 300 years of colonialism to transform China. In 100 years of colonialism, Hong Kong has changed to what we see today. With China being so big, of course it would require 300 years as a colony for it to be able to transform into how Hong Kong is today. I have my doubts as to whether 300 years would be enough. Yikes. Since the beginning of June, following two months of on and off protests, Troops slowly made their way into Beijing. A number of these troops moved towards Tiananmen Square. The troops continued their negotiations and almost reached an agreement with the students that would have ended the protests. But this was sabotaged by the more radical, violent elements of those same liberal protest leaders looking for a fight, not a solution. On the morning of June 3rd, more attacks were made on military vehicles. Reporters for Time Magazine stated, By 7am though, students and young workers outside Zhongnanhai were smashing their way into two military buses filled with light machine guns and crates of ammunition. As for isolated pockets of troops hemmed in at the intersections and overpasses around the city, the crowd was not in a mood to merely lecture them. In some places, the troops were stripped almost naked, chased or struck by angry citizens. Other injured troops had difficulty getting to hospitals as mobs deflated or slashed the tires of military ambulances. This isn't the least of it. I'm not gonna show any of the footage, but the violence reached such a point that unarmed soldiers were burned alive. Some calculations have up to half the dead being PLA soldiers trapped in their armored personnel carriers, buses and tanks as the vehicles were torched. Others were killed and brutally mutilated by protesters with various implements. These events that actually happened are instead overshadowed by mythical tanks running over people in tents, which never happened. Only after this did the government respond with violence in turn. The decision was made to bring in the troops which remained outside Beijing. At 6.30 on the night of June 3rd, the announcement was made around Beijing that people should remain in their neighborhoods and stay away from Tiananmen Square. Around midnight, soldiers stationed about 3 miles west of the square are said to have started firing indiscriminately at unarmed civilians in the streets. Chang'an Boulevard in particular became the scene of intense and brutal confrontations. People staying at the Beijing Hotel, close to the square, reported seeing troops open fire on unarmed citizens who were too far away to pose any real threat. This is, however, countered by other Western reporting and comments from protesters that said no indiscriminate firing ever occurred. Estimates suggest that between 200 and 300 people, both civilian and military, were killed during these confrontations back and forth. A lot of the violence happened as troops tried to push through the barricades and crowds. As for the square itself, a Taiwan-born singer and composer, Hao Dejan, who joined the student protesters at the square and negotiated with the Chinese army commissar, said, During the whole withdrawal process, I didn't see a single student, other citizens, or soldiers killed in the square, nor did I see any armored troop carriers rolling over people. Richard Ross from CBS News reported being held by Chinese troops while driving through the square and didn't see any bodies or signs of a massacre. Additionally, James Miles, BBC's Beijing correspondent, said, there was violence in Beijing, but no massacre in the square itself. Accounts from diplomats are very similar. A Chilean diplomat inside the square noted that while there were sporadic gunshots, most troops had non-lethal gear like batons and clubs. This particular diplomat's account supports the view that there was no mass shooting in the square itself. Even US embassy cables, later released or unwillingly released by WikiLeaks, 
confirmed that the worst violence happened outside the square, especially at Mushidi, three miles west. These accounts from a diverse set of people and motivations challenges this widely held belief that there was a massacre within Tiananmen Square. The Chinese government always claimed no one was killed in the square, but they don't deny the serious violence and deaths that occurred in the surrounding areas. These reports from Western diplomats and journalists back that up. The Chinese government's account of the events was initially dismissed as propaganda, of course, but turned out to be more or less correct. They reported about 300 deaths, which is true, including many soldiers of the PLA. In contrast, Western sources seemed to decide at random what the death toll was. They claimed and still claim that thousands had died, ranging from 2,600 to as high as 10,000 people. Nicholas Kristof from the New York Times suggested, basically by guessing, that about a dozen soldiers and policemen were killed, along with 400 to 800 civilians. On the 12th of June, 1989, the New York Times published an exhaustive but entirely fabricated eyewitness report describing brutal mass killings in the square. Eyewitness accounts and later investigations, though, revealed that the Chinese government's claims were basically correct. These inflated numbers and presentation were a part of a concerted effort by Western media to craft a very particular narrative, the typical brutal authoritarian regime committing horrific crimes against humanity because the leadership of a particular country isn't a US puppet and Western capital can't exploit local labor to the fullest while also stripping the country of all its natural resources for cheap. Israel never gets this kind of coverage in the American press. Why is that? I wonder. And if the West just making stuff up about the incident wasn't enough to completely discredit the grand myth they built, Actually existing evidence in the form of aerial photos of the conflict zone showed over 100 military trucks and armored vehicles torched, lynched PLA soldiers, and most shockingly of all, demonstrators actually stripping the automatic rifles off of soldiers who put up no fight. Yes, seriously. It tells a wildly different story insofar as telling the truth about the incident is concerned. But do you see just how far from the truth the western telling of the story is? Well, if you've been keeping up with the news at all, none of this should be any surprise to you. This is an important note. Many of those killed by the army were in the western part of Beijing and on the way to the square, not in it. This may sound like a distinction without a difference, but it's not. Tiananmen Square is enclosed enough that the image conveyed by claiming there was a massacre in the square is one of shooting fish in a barrel, which is to say that it implies the soldiers were just blindly shooting into a restricted mass of people, which is horrific, but isn't what happened. Now the Tiananmen Square massacre has become a massive Mandela effect moment, a collective false memory, pushed by Western media despite numerous reports and eyewitness accounts to the contrary. So what really happened that day? Well, for starters, this protest was not as spontaneous as it appeared. In the days leading up to the confrontation, the US government was actively involved in promoting the pro-democracy protests through a well-funded, internationally coordinated propaganda machine, much of which came from Voice of America. The protests were also not one ideological trend, but representative of a broad spectrum from working-class Maoists upset with Deng's reforms to liberal urban elites hoping that political reform would bring with it asset speculation and Western-like managerial salaries, and to hell with democracy if it suited them. Guess which section the Western press focused on? Where Kaishi, a leader of the protests, said it in even plainer terms. So, what do we want? Nike shoes, lots of free time to take our girlfriends to the bar, the freedom to discuss an issue with someone and get a little respect from society. Lofty ideals, clearly. When soldiers, who were not given any orders upon arriving on the scene, entered the square on June 4th, 1989, they didn't swarm in, guns blazing. No, instead, a small group of soldiers showed up, unarmed, and spoke with student leaders. More troops arrived and negotiations were eventually interrupted by violence called for from liberal radicals in the crowd, who would go on Western interviews calling for bloodshed because it was supposedly the only thing that would bring change. So again, while most people were there in good faith and looking for mild reforms, people like Chai Ling that you saw in the beginning of the video had ulterior motives. She admitted in an interview that the goal was to provoke the government into a violent crackdown with the hope that it would topple the Communist Party. Oddly similar to the desires of the US, I couldn't possibly understand why. She not only called for bloodshed, but thought that she herself was too important and that she should leave the square should any violence happen. How quaint. She's also on tape talking racist nonsense about how the Chinese aren't worth the effort. Additionally, reports from the time describe how these liberal anti-government fighters were highly organized and grouped themselves into formations of 100 to 150 people around the square, not inside it. They armed themselves with Molotov cocktails and iron clubs to use against the still unarmed PLA. Once the confrontations escalated, the deaths began, starting with dozens of soldiers and later protesters. One of the most interesting bit, a fanciful documentary titled The Gate of Heavenly Peace was made in the 90s, of course funded by the US government, Ford and the Rockefeller Foundation. In it, they rehash the liberal mythology of what happened, but within the interviews which they're trying to use to support the fictitious series of events, the protest leaders admit to, amongst other things, 1. Foreign funding and support, 
2. The desire to overthrow the government. 3. Political suppression of liberals by other liberals within the protest themselves. So much for democracy. 4. Them admitting to lying about bloodshed on the square, and specifically the tanks rolling over people part. 5. Weird racism about Chinese people not being ready for democracy, not having the brain for it, and other cringe. And finally, 6. Wanting to instigate as much state violence as possible from the get-go. By the way, remember Kai Shi from earlier? He's a proven liar as well. He had claimed to have seen 200 students cut down by gunfire at the square, but it was later proven that he left the square several hours before the events he described allegedly occurred. According to the Columbia Journalism Review, all verified eyewitness accounts clearly stated that the students who had remained in the square when troops arrived to clear them had all been allowed to leave the square peacefully, about foreign support. The movement received both financial and moral support from various international sources, particularly the United States. Newspapers and organizations in the US, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the UK were publishing false reports and providing outside financial support to the movement. Now, this wouldn't be a proper US-backed attempted coup or color revolution if we didn't talk about the Voice of America. Voice of America was pumping out propaganda at an incredible speed, increasing its Chinese language broadcasts to 11 hours daily, with the specific goal of creating confusion and panic not just among Chinese citizens, but soldiers as well. Sensational reporting and claims were pushed such as soldiers were firing on other soldiers and that key government figures had been killed. This was designed to portray the Chinese government as chaotic and violent and to spur further instability. Western journalists, ever so honest, made sure to portray the students as noble and idealistic, focusing on acts of generosity by people in Hong Kong and elsewhere who sent material support to the students, but made no mention of American propaganda channels working overtime on the students. There's also some anecdotal evidence of the CIA providing materiel and support to the protesters, in a similar pattern to the support they gave Eastern European counter-revolutionary movements, but I didn't include it here because it's not as concrete as I would like. At least not yet, this stuff will come out eventually. What we do know is that the inventor of the concept of American-backed color revolutions, Gene Sharp, was at Tiananmen Square during the protests. Sharp's co-worker, Colonel Robert Helvey, had also trained in Hong Kong the student leaders from Beijing in mass demonstration techniques, which they were to subsequently use in the Tiananmen Square incident of June 1989. He would later go on to train Falun Gong in China in similar civil disobedience techniques. Following the crackdown through Operation Yellbird, many of the student leaders escaped to the United States with the help of the CIA or other intelligence, where almost all of them gained privileged positions. I wonder why? They became either conservative media heads, investment bankers, hedge fund managers, political appointees, or other rewards for what they had done. Imagine the inverse for a second. Massive protests in the US, sponsored by the Chinese, where afterwards every major protest leader is smuggled out of China to China, living privileged and comfortable lives afterwards. Really gets the critical thinking going for a second. The myth of the Tiananmen Square Massacre is one of the West's favorite rallying cries to defend the democracy, and in the words of Noam Chomsky, the uniformity and obedience of the media, which any dictator would admire, push it dutifully. A few years earlier, in the spring of 1980, the US-backed military dictatorship of the Republic of Korea put down the Gwangju democratization movement, with an estimated dead of up to 2,000 people. In the beginning of 1989, just months before Tiananmen Square, the US-backed right-wing Venezuelan government of Carlos Andres Perez squashed protests that lasted nine days, where up to 1,000 people were slaughtered by the Venezuelan military. To quote the Red Sails article I recommend you read, it should strike as a strange that these comparable incidents are not taught to anyone in the West, let alone commemorated in a yearly fashion. Could it possibly be because they don't actually care about freedom and democracy? Uh, yes, it's, it's absolutely that. The reason the Tiananmen Square event is propagandized to this level is because China is a geopolitical enemy of the US, not by choice, but because they dare to grow their economy on their own merits and to eventually challenge the US's unipolar domination on the earth. For the leftists listening, read section 5 of the Red Sails article. Since China has been slandered so much over an incident that didn't happen, as popularly believed, and since the US is the main culprit in the creation and perpetuation of the myth, let's take a look at some events in the US that were as bad or worse than the events of Tiananmen Square that basically nobody knows about. With World War I out of the way and the Spanish flu being contained, it was time for taking out some anger on black people, a favorite American pastime. In 1921 Oklahoma, in the town of Tulsa, African Americans had built a fairly wealthy community called Greenwood, an extreme rarity at the time, nicknamed Black Wall Street. The massacre, known as the Tulsa Race Massacre, took place on the night of May 31st and continued into the morning of June 1st, 1921. 
white residents of Tulsa launched a devastating attack on Greenwood, sparked by inflammatory coverage in the Tulsa Tribune regarding an alleged grave attempt by a young black man on a white girl that was almost certainly either an exaggeration of an innocent interaction or entirely fabricated, both of which are historically common tactics used to justify violence against black people or colonial subjects just look at Palestine. Regardless, the economic success of the Greenwood community simply made them a convenient scapegoat. It's also true that historically, this kind of violence against black people, who some whites thought were doing too well for themselves, was common. White mobs, many wearing their World War I army uniforms, set fires throughout the Greenwood district, with the Tulsa police officers joining in on the arson of black businesses along Archer Street. The result was predictably devastating, an estimated 300 dead and over 4,000 black residents who were jailed and placed under armed guard in various locations. The town was put under martial law and black people, and only black people, were required to carry identity cards, known as green cards, to get around. Greenwood was obliterated, over 1,000 residences burned, another 400 looted and countless lives lost. Hey, speaking of the US police state, let's move ahead to 1980s Philadelphia with a radical black group called MOVE. The organization, founded by Vincent Leapart in 1972, was rooted in a unique blend of black liberation, environmentalism, back to nature principles. MOVE members rejected modern technology, instead advocating for a lifestyle that was in harmony with the natural world, whatever that means, which they believed would lead to true freedom and justice, liberal nonsense for sure, but not deserving what came next by any means. Over time, the group became increasingly militant, leading to numerous confrontations with law enforcement. The police used their unusual lifestyle as an excuse to surveil the group, amongst other violations of their rights. The group's headquarters was located in a row house in West Philadelphia, a residential area. Throughout the 1970s and early 80s, MOVE had multiple dramatic encounters with the police. The conflicts reached a critical point on May 13, 1985, when after hours of unsuccessful attempts to resolve things peacefully, the police decided to bomb the house occupied by MOVE members, including children. The bomb, dropped from a police helicopter, ignited a fire that quickly spread out of control to neighboring areas. The fire was particularly bad because police prevented fire crews for hours from putting it out. 61 homes in the neighborhood were completely destroyed, with the fire killing 11 people, including 5 children and Vincent Leapart. It remains one of the worst incidents of police violence in US history, though American police are always itching to beat their record, and their wives. This was 10 minutes of research. Post-BLM police violence, surveillance, and protest crushing could easily fill an hour of content. American support of protest crushing abroad could fill 10. There is no historical instance in all of Chinese history that compares to the MOVE bombing. The US police and military have been orders of magnitude more violent towards its own citizens advocating for their rights or otherwise living or existing in a way that angered the ruling and privileged classes of their day. Yet these are in no way propagandized internationally, let alone remembered internally, as much as the Tiananmen Square event is in the West. That's my point here, it doesn't make either or okay, I'm just highlighting the hypocrisy of the feigned outrage that happens year in and year out despite basically no coverage or remembrance of things that happened last week in the grand scheme of things. The legacy of Tiananmen Square is, unfortunately, currently in the hands of Western media and governments. They've been pushing the massacre myth. Outlets like the New York Times dutifully spread the myth for the US government, in spite of the facts. The Columbia Journalism Review clearly shows that a lot of the reports about deaths in the square were based on bogus eyewitness accounts. Similar to what happened in Eastern Europe, behind the scenes there was support from the West and particularly the US, essentially reinforcing the view that whoever doesn't align with American foreign policy and capital must be gotten rid of no matter what the true will of even the protesters may be. China's economic boom softened the West's stance on the country since they could make money there. But the idea that China is especially politically repressive still shapes how the Western world handles diplomacy and business with China. This stands in direct contrast to rogue states like the US and Israel, which do whatever they want internally as well as on the international stage, with zero consequences. So what's the takeaway here? The United States, always lecturing the world on violating sovereignty or human rights, played a significant role in fanning the flames of discontent in China. We don't know yet the full extent, but through propaganda, covert actions and destabilization efforts, the US followed its tried and true playbook, stoking unrest then attempting to guide the resulting chaos in its favor. China's government does have to, and in many ways did, answer for the violence and the loss of innocent lives, but let's not forget that the mythmaker here has a long and bloody history of doing far, far worse. If we're going to condemn China for the Tiananmen Square incident, then we must equally, if not more, condemn the US for the last 248 years of non-stop colonialism, imperialism, and genocide, should you be intellectually honest and consistent, that is. The best resource list I can recommend for further reading is the Shao Collective Collection as you see on screen now. 
That's all for this time. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. I'd like to thank my patrons, so thank you too. Nitro Dubs, Kenny, Thomas Roberts, Nicholas, Owen Baker, T. Wood, Dr. Lemon Man, Lumix, Charlie and Eric, Ultimate Turin, Daniel Ethel, The Generic Guy, Santiago Pereira, Rain, Xander Corvus, David Fries, Confuse M, Mariana Mastosevich, Robbie Richardson, and Masei Kadro. Thanks for watching.